See, it's one thing to mentally understand something, but quite another to practically get it and put it in <clears throat> to practice. Well, as we move to the last three chapters of Ephesians, we're going to learn how to live out our faith. <clears throat> the first three have been about your position in Christ, who you are in Christ. You're saved by grace. You're seated in the heavenlies. And tonight, we're going to begin talking about what does that look like practically? How do we live in this fallen world uh, in light of those truths? Now, before we get into Ephesians 4, I, I, I want to go back a few verses in Ephesians 3 to kind of set the tone for tonight. So let's, let's begin in Ephesians 3, verse 14. <clears throat> for this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man <clears throat> so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. <clears throat> I frequently <clears throat> focus and I'm amazed by God's power. I watch on the news, thank goodness I've never been actually in one, the ferocity of a tornado. I did actually see in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, I saw the aftermath of a couple tornadoes, and it is wicked. I mean, it just tears through the city and uproots trees, and just five feet away, you can have something completely untouched, but five feet over, just a house is leveled. Just tremendous power. The energy of a lightning and thunderstorm, just the power there and the electricity that's generated, and I'm in awe of God's power. I'm awestruck <clears throat> and brought to praise whenever I see God's creativity in creation. I, I, I really love nature and it, it, I feel close to God out there and I see his handiwork. When I think of God's, just the, the creative ability that he has, he made a giraffe. How did God think of making a giraffe? Who would think of making an animal that, with a neck that's forever? And then you have to take a look at the sloth, Who, uh, a sloth. Everything is dramatic and slow, right? It's, it's just crazy. Then you have the cheetah, who just, just, you know, zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds. You have <clears throat> the ostrich, big bird, the largest bird that we have, can't fly, but just a big, big bird literally, big bird. And then you have the little hummingbird. And God says, I want something big. And then I just want just a little tiny one that kind of flaps his wings and you can come and put sugar out there and he'll suck the sugar out of your little hanging thing there. I want people to have that. And <clears throat> all the different trees and the flowers and the plants. And I, I'm just uh, awestruck by God's creativity. I'm intrigued by the diversity of people. That intrigues me, that there are certain races and ethnicities, uh, genders, men and women, uh, who have cultural and genetic qualities that make them unique uh, as a gender, unique as a race. That just intrigues me that God has hardwired those, those qualities into people. But one thing that I haven't pondered as closely is the square footage of God's love. Paul describes it as the height and the breadth. What am I talking about? I haven't pondered deep enough yet, I don't think, that would cause me to be able to mentally understand the bigness of God's love that he would actually come out of heaven, become a man, and die for people that he didn't even know. Die for someone else. That, that is just something I, did, I don't quite grasp yet. Not only that, but that he would forgive the most heinous of sinners, the worst of the worst, that he would forgive them. 
The thief on the cross, I think we're all familiar with that story, right? Two, two thieves, Jesus was crucified in the middle of two thieves, and you know the story. One was mocking him, hey, if you're the son of God, get us off here. And the other one says, man, you know, leave him alone. We're guilty. He's innocent. We're guilty. We're dying for something that we did. And right then Jesus said, today you'll be with me today in paradise. But I wonder what that guy was being crucified for. I mean, I, I, don't, know what, I don't know what you imagine. You know, what was his crime? Was he an insurrectionist against the Roman government? Is that why the Romans crucified him? Did he maybe kill somebody? Was he a robber? But what if... What if that guy, that Jesus said, today, you'll be with me today in paradise. What if he was a pedophile who molested and tortured and killed a toddler, killed a baby? Hmm, does that, does that change uh, your view of Jesus' forgiveness? What if he molested one of Jesus' earthly sisters? Oh. Would, would he, Jesus still said, today you'll be with me to paradise? Would there have been just no question about it? I, I think of that. Is his love that big? And see, this is the idea that Paul is trying to convey here, that who can measure God's capacity? How, how do you measure it? And Paul says it's that understanding, understanding that it is immeasurable, that should be the foundation for us as we walk out our faith, as we're going to see in these last three chapters of Ephesians, is from a foundation of love. That love should be the foundation that, that filters how we relate to people, how we relate to situations. And so we're going to uh, just glean some good things tonight. Vicki was watching one of her true crime stories as she was uh, on the treadmill the other day. And she said, oh, this was tragic. He said, two uh, Jehovah Witness uh, boys were raised up in the Jehovah Witness faith. And uh, if you know much about that faith, they uh, would wear little suits and go around the neighborhood and hand out literature for the Jehovah Witness faith. And uh, I guess they had to go even to school in Texas. I don't know if it was a, a private school, but they'd have to wear their tuxes there and were ridiculed by their friends. And they don't celebrate birthdays and they don't celebrate Christmas. And, and uh, they would have to be excused or sit in the corner whenever they'd have a Christmas party at school. And these kids were just, just embarrassed. They said they got older and they rebelled. And to the point that they just got mixed up into to drugs and alcohol and uh, got into neo-Nazism and ended up killing their mom and dad and their younger brother, murdered him, just full of hate. I'm not sure where it came from. And, and I contrast that with John, the apostle. And John, who is described and describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, I wondered, why, why would John describe himself that way? Now, John was the, the son of Zebedee, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, a commercial fisherman. I imagine Zebedee was just a salty old tough fisherman maybe. And for some reason, this James and John, remember, they were called what? The sons of thunder. These guys who at one time said, you know what? These Samaritans won't let us cross through. Just give me the word, Jesus. We'll call fire down and we'll burn them up. And these guys were ready to fight at the drop of a hat. Something broke in him around Jesus. And this guy became the most lovable guy. This is the guy that's leaning up against Jesus at the Last Supper and just became a lovey-dovey guy to the point where he endured being boiled in oil, tried to kill him. He survived that, history says. He uh, was banished to the island of Patmos, a deserted island, and wrote the book of Revelation over there and had a vibrant faith in spite of these difficulties. Why? Because I think he just understood the depths of Christ's love. It, it flavored and it filtered and it provided a foundation for everything that he did. So super important that, that we understand that as we begin to talk about how you walk out your faith, it's from a foundation of love. Christ's love in us that is poured out to people, that everything, every situation we, we face is there has to be love. And I, I'm, I've been doing good on this. I kind of had a little backsliding thing today. Uh, I, remember I told you, do not respond in any road rage situation, okay? Too dangerous. You'll get shot and killed. Just, just let them go by. But I was going to Roberto's on Wednesday night, and, 
and I'm, I'm going, I'm, it's, you know, it's a five o'clock train, everybody's going fast, and I'm going, you know, okay, and this guy's just on my tail, and I put my blinker on, and he's not paying attention. I saw it slip back, he has to hit his brakes, and it honks at me as I'm making the turn, and I should have just ignored it, but I had to give him a good honk and a look, and Doug, you're going against your own advice that you're giving everybody. Let it go. Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's stop there for a second. Let's take a look at some of these words. What does humility mean? It means low-minded. You, you don't think that you're it. You're, you're low-minded. You're, you're, you're just saying, hey, I'm, I'm nothing special here. We get a picture of what humility looks like uh, in the parable that Jesus told. It's in Luke chapter 14, verse 7. Let's read it. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you're invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you'll have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so humility is not, it's not going around saying, I'm worth nothing, I can't do anything. It's just saying, I'm going to take a low position. I'm going to have a low view of myself. I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to sit at the last chair, and I'm going to defer to other people. And I just believe that if God wants me to go to the front of the line, to the head of the table, he'll get me up there. But I'm, no, I'm nothing special. I'm going to let God raise me up. I'm going to let God elevate me. That's what it means to walk in humility. It also says that we're to live out our faith uh, being gentle with patience. Gentle with patience. Other translations use the word meekness. Meekness is the picture of strength under control. It's, it's the idea of a well-trained horse who as you get on top of the horse, that horse has the potential just to buck you and to take you off and just throw you all over. It's just, it's got horsepower, literally. But because it's well-trained, all you have to do is just gently pull back in the reins and it stops, just a little here, a little there, and it goes. Why? Because it's under control. It's strong, but it's under control. It, it, it has its emotions down. That's the picture of meekness. Married couples would fight a lot less if they would focus on the tone of their words with each other, if they would be gentle and patient. They, they would fight so less frequently. For instance, let, let me just give you an example of tone. Let's say that your wife asks you to take the garbage out. Honey, will you take the garbage out? Here are two different responses with two different tones. Honey, will you take the garbage out? Okay, sure. Let me just finish this text first. Okay, that's one tone. Honey, will you take the garbage out? Okay, sure. Let me just finish this text. Same words, different tone. Which one do you think is going to start a fight, potentially? <laughs> that first one, right? Okay, sure. Let me finish this text. Like, in other words, you're bothering me. You're interrupting me. Tone. It's not just wrong words that we say. It's the wrong tone. So if you want to be happily or happily married, if you want to have less conflict in your relationships, learn how to use the proper tone. Thirdly, it says that we're to be tolerant with other people. Tolerant means to put up with something, to hold back from saying or doing something. It's picking your battles. Not every situation needs to be addressed. If you are, as my wife uses this term, you know, the, the right police, that you've got to just set everybody right. You're going to set everybody straight. 
If you're going to be the right police, man, you're going to have just conflict all over the place. And, and you're going to just have a bunch of people mad at you because you're, you have no tolerance. It's got to be done this way and it's got to be done now. And, and it's picking your battles to be tolerant. Not every fight needs to be fought. And then lastly, it says to be diligent to maintain unity. Unity. Staying united as a church. Staying united as a couple or as a parent with your kids, it takes intentionality. You have to be intentional about it. You have to guard unity. It, it's not something that you naturally fall into. It's something that you have to be strategic about. It's something that you have to value that says, I will not uh, be estranged from my spouse. I will not have relationship cut off with my kids. I'm not going to, to have good friends, have something come up that's going to create uh, a, a disunity. I, I'm going to do what needs to be done so we can stay together. And you do the necessary work, the, the necessary conversation you need to have to maintain unity. It's so, so key and important. And then it goes on in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 4. There's one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, there are many individual churches. Valley Vegas is an individual church. Uh, Central Christian is an individual church. Uh, other churches in town. The First Baptist is an individual church. There are many denominations. We are a non-denominational church. Uh, there are Baptist churches, there's Pentecostal churches, there's Lutherans, Methodists, all the different, there's different denominations. Uh, but there's only one body of Christ. The body of Christ is all the Christians, the, all the collective Christians all together whether whatever church they're in, whatever denomination they're in, it's the body of Christ. We're all under the same heading, under the same uh, roof there, okay? That's the body of Christ. Now, verse 7, Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Now, this is a perplexing portion of Scripture. Most Bible scholars believe that this uh, is referring to that when Christ, after he was crucified and he was laid in the tomb, before he was discovered uh, not being there by the women at the empty tomb, that he went down into the ground, down into uh, Hades. And there in Hades, you had Abraham's bosom. Hell was kind of divided. Uh, the inner part was divided. You had Abraham's bosom. That's where the Old Testament saints would wait. And then you had the other side where the people were just, just waiting uh, to be for the final judgment day. Uh, these people believe, commentators, and I, I lean towards this too, that Christ went down there and he made proclamation to them. And he brought them up with him. Now, remember uh, in uh, the story that after Jesus was resurrected, you have that portion in the Gospels where people actually says the tombs were open and many people saw their loved ones who had died before. And just a, just a, a crazy thing where people had come out of the tombs and they were alive. Many people believe, or scholars believe, I do too, I, I think, that these were the Old Testament saints that came out, and then when Jesus was sent up to the Father, he brought those saints with him. Uh, and they cite Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Uh, let, let's read that. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. They're thinking that that's, that's where he went. He went down there. And he made, First Peter talks about making proclamation uh, to the spirits down there. So uh, it's interesting. If you want to read a little bit about what Abraham's bosom looks like, read Luke 16. It's the story of the 
rich man and Lazarus. Verse 11 of Ephesians 4. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Whenever we gather like what we're doing tonight, a, a corporate gathering together, a church, the ecclesia, the, the, the coming together individual saints, everything is to be done for the building up of the individual believers, uh, hence corporately the church is built up. Everything that we do here is designed to encourage you and to build you up and to strengthen you. We're strategic around here. You think we sell just really good coffee at a really affordable price just because, you know, we like coffee. Well, we do like coffee. But that's strategic. Is we want you to go out there and we hope that as you go out there and get a cup of coffee, maybe you'll talk with somebody there. Maybe you will sit down there and meet somebody or you'll get a chance to just relax and fellowship and, and be around other Christians. That's strategic. Why? Because that's going to build you up. You're, you're, you're going to experience that. Even our picnic, that's, that's designed to build you up. We want you to meet people. We want you to have a good time. We want you to kind of let your hair down a little bit. We want to see how you act outside of church. I want to see how you act on a baseball field when you fall down after me telling you don't run real fast. Uh, we want to get out there and get to know you. All those things are strategic. Everything here is meant to build you up. Every spiritual gift that God gives, including these, these for uh, offices in the church, are meant to build you up. For instance, let's talk about apostles first. Who are apostles? They are spiritual leaders, pastors, uh, others, who are sent out to establish ministries. People that are gifted, they have the ability to start ministries. I would say that Pastor Ron Vietti uh, has uh, probably an apostleship gifting. Uh, he's the one who came over here and started this church, uh, paid the price for it. Uh, what, um, nearly 20 years ago, we would come over here uh, every Thursday night. We would do a Sunday in Bakersfield, do a Wednesday here, and then drive over and start off with a Thursday night here. Uh, remember the story one night he came here, and there's only four people uh, there. And he told David, I don't, I don't want to get out. I want to go home. He says, you can't. You're the pastor. You have to get out. And, and, uh, but he paid the price, and eventually, here's what we're experiencing today, uh, 20 years later. Not many people can do that. That's a special gifting to be able to rally people and get people excited in a new work. That, that's, that's only a gifting of God. So an apostle, uh, that's an establishing ministry. They establish, okay, if you're an apostle. Then there's prophets. Prophets are those who speak the word of God by the Spirit. It can be forth telling. It, 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 I mean, it can be futuristic and be, hey, God is saying this is going to happen. God is, is wanting to do something here. Uh, it can be something towards the future. Or it can just be forth telling of the word. It can be an anointed, spirit-led message. Uh, my wife, who teaches up here uh, sometimes on Sunday, she would probably more accurately be described as a prophetess. And when she gets up here, I hear so many comments, man, God, God spoke to me. That, that was of the Lord. And so she'll have a message that the Spirit will give her, and she'll deliver that message. And it's, it's, it's within the confines of, of prophecies, can, can speak in church. A lot of people say, well, a woman shouldn't teach in church. Well, she's not teaching. She's prophesying, if you want to be technical. And Anna was a prophetess. And so, so, so that's her gift. And, and it's something that the, the Spirit of God is saying. So prophets, they have a guiding ministry. They kind of guide you. They'll say something, and it kind of gives you some direction. God is leading me here, or God just confirmed that to me here. And then you have evangelists. Evangelists are those who bring people into the kingdom. Uh, that's simply a gathering ministry. They're the people that just go out and preach, and they have this gifting that, when, man, when they preach, people get saved, and they bring people into the kingdom. And then you have pastors, and that's probably uh, more where, where uh, I came in. I, when I was first in the ministry, I was just a real pretty much 100% pastor, those are people who protect and care for the flock. Uh, they, they just check on people. It's, it's a guarding ministry. 
Uh, they're like a shepherd out there. Just, they're, they're just feeding sheep. Here, here's some food. Here's some food. And, and be careful. There's a wolf over there. Be careful. Be careful here. And you'll, boom, get away, you wolf. Here you go. You're here. So you're, you're constantly building people up. And anybody tries to come into the church and cause problems, you're, you're taking behind the church and taking care of business. And you're back loving the, loving the sheep again. So that, that's kind of what a shepherd is. And then you have, and that's a guardian ministry. Then you have teachers. Uh, teachers are those who establish people in the truth of God's word. They're able to teach principles. They're able to teach some doctrine. Uh, and this is a grounding ministry. Uh, they, the teachers help people get grounded in their faith. They get saved. Now let's get grounded. Let, let's get some of the, the elemental foundational things down uh, of the Christian faith. Okay, let's finish up. Uh, verse 14. We're just going to get to 16 verses tonight. Verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So it's saying that these spiritual gifts, and, and we just have five of what, what is called the office gifts listed here. There's, there's another whole list of gifts listed in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and in, the, in Romans. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll see some of those giftings as you read through there. But mature Christians, they aren't carried away by every wave of church practice or new experience that comes blowing in. He says, you need to grow in your faith so that when some Yahoo comes along and he says, you know, that's not right what your pastor is saying, this is what you should believe, and it does not line up with the word of God, you'll be mature enough to say, I smell a skunk here. No, that, that, that's, that's not right. The word of God doesn't say it. I have discernment of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's not right. No. Versus, you know, people sometimes getting caught, oh, okay, that's what it's supposed to do, and they, they, they get off track and they, they go down roads. Years ago, there's, there's been many things from the church over the years, but uh, there was a, just a weird, a real kind of a weird phenomenon uh, 20 years ago or so, uh, 30 maybe, maybe years, years, I can't lose track of the time anymore. Uh, but this phenomenon came in where people were laughing in church and they were saying, you know, the spirit of God's moving. Oh, he's moving. Ha, 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 ha. And just all of a sudden the pastor's preaching and, and everybody just start this uncontrollable laughing and, and the pastor, ha, I'm laughing too. And, and they would call that a move of the spirit. I'd call that. I don't see anything that is building anybody up. If an unbeliever come, I think they'd be freaked out. I just don't see that being of the Lord. Uh, then they had the roaring thing where people were roaring like lions. Roar! And they were roaring and all kinds of stuff come down the road. Just like every part of our body is important and has a purpose, so too does every person have a part and purpose in Christ's body. You have to understand that. That every part, just like your physical body, if one part isn't working properly, the rest of the body will feel it. I experienced this when I was playing baseball. I would get this bruise right there in, the, the, in between my thumb, that little thing right there. There's a tendon right there, and it, it would happen when you would hit a ball and it would hit down too low in the bat, and it would just rattle your hand. Oh, my gosh, it would just hurt and bruise. And I'd put, I'd put a pad over, over my thumb, and it just, oh, it was so painful. It affected the rest of my body. I, I'd find my arms trying to compensate for it. So if one part of Christ's body is not functioning, it puts a strain on the other parts. And so it's really important that we all identify what our spiritual gifts are and then employ them in the, the church that you attend and use them. And by doing that, it helps the body to be uh, healthy. It helps it to function and we can be more complete in Christ. Now, in order to use your spiritual gifts, you have to know what your spiritual gifts are. And I know we have probably a lot of young believers, a lot of uh, first-generation believers. So uh, what I, I did, I found a great spiritual gift test 
uh, that is available for you. Uh, when you leave here tonight uh, at the Welcome Center, you can pick it up, just, just uh, one per person if you would. And I want to make sure everybody here gets a chance to get one. If we need more, we'll have some more next week. Uh, but you can take that, that uh, spiritual gift test and uh, find out uh, how God made you and then, then take a look, okay, here's how I am, here's the gifts God's given me, where can I use those in the church and in the body of Christ to help other people and be built up? So I want to end, I want to show you this young guy found his gift early. I, I, I think this guy might be an evangelist or a teacher, okay? T take a look at this little guy. He found his gift super early. nasty stuff out of our heart. And he saved our lives because he was our love. He was our faith. That's true. We can never count on him. We can count on him all we want. And, and, and the faith. That little guy, I think that's my grandson Titus when he was younger. We call him Pastor Titus now. I don't know what he was talking about. He just had nasty sin in your heart, and the devil almost got us. <laughs> we, we still laugh at that thing. Oh, my goodness. Well, hey, uh, so cool. I, I love seeing people use their gift. This guy here, Ty Chu, has found his gift. This guy has a gift of encouragement. How many people have been hugged by Ty? Yeah. Like, yeah, he's, he's found his gift. He's been doing that for 20 years, Ty. Yeah. And, and it's blessed people, and it's encouraged people. And so uh, find your gift, employ it, help others be built up because I'm sure that you're receiving from them uh, as well. But let's pray this. Lord, Father, we thank you, Lord, that, Lord, we have a, the foundation of how we're to live uh, in this world, and it's the foundation of love. When in doubt, God, we're to love. If we're, we're, if we're not sure what to do in a certain situation, then we'll just choose to love. We can never go wrong just, just loving and showing gentleness and grace and patience and mercy, God. So, Lord, I pray as we continue through our study in Ephesians that you'll show us as we uh, will get into how we're to uh, relate as a husband and wife and, and how we're to engage in spiritual warfare uh, and how we're to uh, speak uh, the words that we, we, we talk, how we're to, to uh, speak to one another, God, that you would just show us, Lord, how to live out our faith the way that we're supposed to uh, tonight, Lord. So, God, we love you. If, if people need to get uh, right with you tonight, God, it's, it's just as simple as saying, God, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm sorry, God. I want to come back to you. Come inside of me. Fill me. I give my life to you, Lord. It's as simple as that, Father. Just draw people to yourself tonight that need to have that happen, God. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you. In the name of your son, Jesus, who gave his life for us, God. Oh, God, help us understand that love. Help us understand how big it is, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Hey, church family. We're so glad you stopped by to check out this video today. Before you go, we just want to share a few things with you. If this is your first time checking us out online, I wanna encourage you to head to valleyvegas.org. You can see all of our upcoming events. You can see all the life groups you can get plugged into. And you can also see all the ministry opportunities we have going on at our church. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by heading to valleyvegas.org slash give. While it's awesome that we can meet and have church right here like this, we would love to see you here on campus with us. Wanna let you know our service times, which are 9 a.m., 10.15, 11.45 a.m. on Sundays, as well as a 7 p.m. service on Wednesdays. We hope to see you online or in person again real soon. God bless.